Previously on the Heavy Spoilers Show. And if you want me to see Alien 3, m make sure you comment below. Thank you. Peace. <laughs> Hopefully not. Don't you dare comment, mate. I'm not watching Alien 3. Ah, oh, sh**. Here we go again. So after dropping two big breakdowns on Alien and Aliens, it was of course inevitable that I'd eventually have to touch on Alien 3. Hated by its director, burned by the fans upon its release, and constantly surrounded by controversy, I think this is a film that's definitely worth discussing. Now if you ask people whether they love the first two movies, then chances are you're gonna get the exact same answer. In the case of Alien 3 though, it normally depends on who you talk to, and the film's built a fan base even though it was extremely divisive at the time. Now before getting into the actual breakdown of the film, I think we have to talk about what it went through to get us to this point. In total there's rumoured to be over 30 different scripts for the film and it got to a point that Fox was so frustrated with everything that they just put their foot down and dropped a teaser announcing that there would be a new Alien movie releasing in 1992. Spending 6 years in development, Fox wanted to make a sequel that was more Aliens than Alien and early on there was a lot of back and forth with Brandywine Productions. Those guys didn't want to just do a repeat of the first two films, whereas Fox wanted a military style movie centered around Hicks fighting the Xenomorphs on either Earth or their home planet. We discovered in space, no one can hear you scream. In 1992, we will discover on Earth, everyone can hear you scream. The speculation was rightly fueled by that tagline, and if the time had have been around then, then everyone would have correctly guessed that something was happening on Earth. However, the movie went through eight drafts after that, and things changed up immensely. Now, the reason that they had to settle on Hicks was that things had become difficult with Sigourney Weaver after the release of Aliens. If you checked out our breakdown on that movie, then you'll know she was furious that the daughter plot got cut from the film, and though it was eventually added in the director's cut, it burned a lot of bridges. It has to die. However, the studio didn't really see that as being too much of a bad thing. After all, Ripley had got a happy ending, taken you to her surrogate daughter, and faced up to her fears in the alien nest. She was gonna cameo in Alien 3, which we'll talk about later on, but it's important to bear in mind she wasn't a major part of this movie. So Hicks was seen as the way to go, and Brandywine wanted to look into the Whalen yutani Corporation as being the big bad. They operated in the background of the first two films, and though the Xenomorphs were the threat, it was definitely them putting the people in the situation. Described as being like a Cold War, Hicks would deal with the weapons division of the Corporation, who were mass producing the Xenomorphs to use as biological weapons. And that takes us to the William Gibson script, which was the first solid draft that Fox had. We join the Solar Cove floating in space, which is where it would be found by some socialists known as the Union of Progressive Peoples. Boarding the vessel, they'd be attacked by a facehugger that had hid in the entrails of Bishop's body. Though they killed it, they realised there was more here than just a salvage mission, and they took the Solarco to a space station shopping mall hybrid known as the Anchor Point. Ripley was in a coma, and Hicks would then explore the vessel, only to find Whalen yutani developing an alien army. The film would then end with it setting up a fourth movie, and this would take things to the alien homeworld which would close out the franchise. After Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Rennie Holland was attached to direct, and along with the Xenomorphs, he really wanted to explore the origins of the space jockey. Now, Though this version never got made, you can find out what happened in it, as there's an audiobook version available, along with a comic that kind of fleshes things out. Now, Before we get into the rest of the breakdown, I just want to give a huge shout out to comicbookdirect.com. It's a perfect place for collectors, and the way that it works is that you can either purchase a book individually, or you can subscribe to the entire run to make sure you never miss it. They work with all the big publishers including Marvel and DC, and also have lots of different Alien comics on there too. I'm just getting back into reading them, I'm really enjoying it, and yeah, I definitely recommend you go and check them out if this video has piqued your interest. Now if you use the link in the description below, you're also going to get 20% off, so definitely head over there right after this. Anyway, back into the video, where we'll get into the movie next, after just wrapping up the William Gibson plan and also all the different versions. The screenplay had a big following on the internet, and when you read it, you can see that, you know, this might have been better. However, the producers were dragging their feet and asking for constant rewrites, so things fell apart and Rennie Harlan went off to go and do Die Hard 2. 
And that takes us into the Eric Red version, which centered around special forces boarding the Sulaco to find everyone dead. From here things moved to a small US city, and we kinda got the plot of this in Aliens vs Predator 2. Given less than two months to do his draft, Red has completely disowned his script due to how rushed it was, and the Brandywines ended up rejecting it because of how far it strayed from their vision. In comes the next version, written by David Dwoy, who was putting it together in a vastly different world. Due to the Cold War now being over, the metaphors with Hicks were outdated, and thus he decided to change things up and set the film on a prison planet. This saw Whale and Utani carrying out human experiments with the facehuggers, and interestingly this later got picked up in Alien Resurrection. Now it was at this time that the problems with the absent Sigourney Weaver started to arise. Fox president Joe Roth thought that Ripley was the centerpiece of the series, and he championed her as being one of the only female action stars that we had in Hollywood. Sigourney was offered $4 million and also given a producer's credit, which is when things started to take shape. Now again, kinda need to talk about our last breakdown to explain what's going on here, but if you watch that then you'll know we brought up Sigourney's demands for that film. When being approached by aliens, she said she wanted no guns in the film, that she would die at the end of the movie, and that she would also have sex with the alien. As we know, this never happened, but now with that producing credit, she got to do two out of three. Why worked her into his script, but he stepped away from the project when he learned Fox were working behind his back with another writer. That's when the ball got rolling with the navigators Vincent Ward, who was invited to direct. The people in charge of Aliens had seen his movie, and they loved the tone of it, thinking that it would be perfect for what they were wanting to go for. Now in case you haven't seen it, it's initially set during the Black Death, and we watch as medieval villagers dig a hole in the ground that takes them to the 20th century. It's mixing medieval with the modern, which you can kind of feel when you watch the finished version of Alien 3. Ward didn't really like this script though, and instead he wanted Ripley to crash on a monastery-like satellite. Made mostly of wood, yes that's right, mostly of wood, the monks on this would have rejected all technology, and they saw Ripley crashing down as being like a fallen star. However, strange things started happening with the xenomorph, and it was believed that she'd brought the devil with her, which led to her being put on trial. She's also pregnant with the alien queen in that version, and eventually decides to sacrifice herself in order to finally kill it. Fox wanted an alternate ending shot in which she lived, but Sigourney Weaver said she'd only do the film if she died at the end. Now, though most of this was scrapped, there were elements brought across such as the almost all-male cast, the vow of celibacy, the pregnancy, and Ripley's death. Ward's version was seen to be more like an art film rather than something they could market though, and they, but they brought up how stupid it was having a wooden planet in space. They wanted to turn the monks into prisoners and the planet into an oil refinery, and Ward eventually was fired after he refused to do this. Thus that leads into what we get, and though Ridley Scott was asked to direct, for reasons unknown he ended up turning it down. Now, David Fincher was picked last minute, and though he's gone on to have a big career, he wasn't really known for much at the time. Primarily, he'd worked as a music video director, and had done work for Aerosmith, The Rolling Stones, Billy Idol, and Paula Abdul. To the studio, they were getting the guy who made Madonna's Vogue, but we know from his sensibilities now that the guy doesn't do big popcorn movies. I love Fincher's work, but it has to be said that his movies have a bleakness to them. Though the game has a happy ending to it, most of his films don't, and his next movie after this would be Seven. Which, yeah, we know how that ended. Put the gun I down. I saw you with the box! What was in the box? Because I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, baby. It seems that envy is my sin. Oh, what's in the box? Now, Finch has often talked about how Ridley Scott's Alien is one of his favourite films, and you can definitely see that influence the vision we get here. However, he too fell victim to Fox's meddling and eventually stepped away from the movie when it was in post-production. Shot for a year and edited for a year, Fox demanded reshoots to fix things and he walked away from it after handing over an assembly cut. Though the special edition release of the movie says that it's a director's cut, it's important to bear in mind that Fincher never gave his approval and he didn't ever go back to the movie to fix things up. The way I tend to remember the movie is through the assembly cut, I've, I've repressed that theatrical one and after going back to it for this review, I was shocked at how incoherent it is. Things fly by at breakneck speed without explanation and the extra 30 minutes in the assembly cut really fleshes things out. The changes come early on and we get an extended first act with more establishing shots, Ripley washing up on the beach and the lights that shows why the colony has to shave their heads. 
It's only slightly referenced in a theatrical, and along with the beach shots, you really get the idea that Ripley's landed in hell. Now, the most major change comes in the form of what creature that the xenomorph bursts out of. In the theatrical cut, the face hugger attaches onto a dog, whereas the assembly cut has it going onto an ox. The ox was thought to be too cumbersome, and y you could probably just tip over the cow xenomorph and then run away was supposed to be old, haggard, and basically a metaphor for Ripley that showed how the prisoners treated women. The studio thought that that idea was stupid though, and that for the alien to be scary, it needed to come from something scary. Now, the Rottweiler was deemed far more ferocious and agile, and thus this is what was used in the theatrical cut. Now, Paul McGann's Golic is almost absent from the theatrical cut, but the psychopath gets way more airtime in the extended version. In both films, who watches Ripley and the prisoners launch a plan to trap the xenomorph in a room used to house toxic waste. Depending on what version you get, gives this a different outcome, with it failing in the theatrical whilst it works in the assembly. Now, this cut has Golic seeing the xenomorph as a dragon, and he eventually frees the beast and unleashes it on the prisoners. To him, he's had a religious experience in a tunnel, and the last person that the xenomorph grabs even has a crucifix on their head. It ties back into the whole monk and Satan thing that we talked about before, and basically gives his character a reason for being in the film, instead of how Fox handled him eventually. Now lastly, we have Ripley's death scene, which has a chest burster coming out of her in the theatrical. This was actually done through reshoots, with them even giving Sigourney a bald cap so she didn't have to shave her head again. In the assembly cut, the chest burster is cut out, but yeah, fire effect, it all still is kind of goofy. I actually prefer the chest burster, yeah, don't shoot me. This was actually done to show Ripley nurturing her almost like a mother nurtures a newborn. It showed the connection between her and the species, and the studio mandated it because the original ending was too close to Terminator 2. It's very much a pick your poison with this moment, but rather than some extra character beats, those are the main differences that you get from both versions. Now the movie actually begins on a down note, or, or rather a good one, as they integrate the alien score into the 20th century Fox fanfare. Like the prior two films, we open on space, but whereas Ripley was peacefully sleeping during this, we get some slight differences. Now, there are some inconsistencies here, and we do see a shot of Ripley and Newt asleep in their pods. Not to be like, actually, but they couldn't actually get their hands on the ones from the end of Aliens, which had a slightly different shape to them. Thus, they had to use the hibernation pods from the first film, which I'm guessing you didn't notice, but the movies just set out to ruin everything about that prior film, so I don't care if I ruin it as well. Now, as the names come in, we get cuts of what's happening on the Sulaco. This originally was a massive point of contention for the fan base, as the film never actually explains what it is happening here, however, we can look at the novel to finally get some answers. Written by Alan Dean Foster, he too clashed with the studio a bit, and he had to cobble together several different scripts in order to make the companion. He also wanted to keep Newt alive, and he was planning on saying her cryotube was damaged, meaning that she had to remain asleep in it for the events of the movie. This was shut down though, and in the end he didn't get everything he needed, and thus the book differs in some ways. For example, there's a bit where Ripley scratches her head and contracts lice, and she also says that she didn't have a daughter, due to that plot being cut from the original Aliens. Ripley also goes up into the vents when looking for the Xenomorph, whereas in the film, she goes into the basement. Dylan also escapes a lava in the book, and he almost acts on his promise to kill Ripley, but just before he can do it, the Xenomorph bursts out and kills him. Anyway, back to the beginning, and though one egg is shown in the film, the book explains that there was at least two of them. I think for the film to work, you have to take it as there being three, but either way, here's what happens in this scene. So a face hugger crawls out of its egg and it goes to get Newt, which is when we see the glass in the front of her pot crack. This cuts the face hugger, which then bleeds on the floor, and this is where the electrical fire is started from that brings the ship down. Now they are trying to misdirect us and make us believe that Newt's the one who got the face hugger on her, so that they can do the twist later on with Ripley being the carrier. We see an x-ray of a face hugger on someone at some point, whereas with Ripley, they never go and show it. However, there is a clue, and the glass on her pod has a cracked hole in it, showing how the face hugger entered it. For the final one, H.R. Giger was brought back to work on the project, and there is concept art of an aquatic face hugger which would have survived the crash and then swam to the shore. Another bit of trivia for you is that there was supposed to be a prosthetic Ripley used for this opener with the face hugger. However, according to what culture, the VFX team unfortunately didn't have enough time to do one of Sigourney Weaver. Instead, they quickly grabbed Emeril's Streep head from the comedy death becomes her and put a curly black wig on it, so 
you can't tell the difference. Now in the escape pod they drop down to the double Y chromosome prison planet which we see is known as Fiorina. Though the nickname says Fury, the word actually pulls from Latin and it means flower, bloom or lastly innocent. I tend to gravitate more towards the last one being why it's been adopted here as these prisoners are very much trying to return to a state of that. They don't want sinner temptation in this world but Ripley coming down of course ends up changing this. Also, I know I keep calling them prisoners, um, but in the assembly cut they say that Whale and Yutani wanted to shut down the facility, but they wanted to stay as custodians, so like, some are locked up, but also some are there voluntarily, so they're not really prisoners, but then some are, look, it's messy. Either way, Double Y seems to be a weird way to list things, and if you've watched our other videos, you'll know we talked about how Lambert was listed as being a male at birth in Aliens, and how they talked about Arturian Poontang being so good, it doesn't matter if they're a guy or a girl. Don't want to go down a big rabbit hole on it as it might be a reach, but this could be further building off the back of the creative team saying genders are more fluid in the future. Therefore, everyone's assigned by the chromosomes they have, which is why this is listed as double Y instead of being a mixture. Anyway, in the film, we do still get those religious metaphors, and Sigourney saw Ripley having a shaven head as being similar to Joan of Arc. Joan was burned at the stake for heresy, and Ripley's journey here to culminate in her death being brought on by fire. When she asks Dylan to end her life, she also puts her arms out in a Christ-like pose, which he mirrors at the end when falling into the vat. And we could see her sacrifices saving the rest of the prisoners as well, which is a Christ-like sort of thing to do, even though at this point there's like one person left. Now the Xenomorph could also be seen as a demonic presence, with Golic worshipping it, and Satan is also described as being like a dragon in the Bible. The ship was supposed to be based on the Star of Bethlehem, the monks were of course changed to prisoners, and there are those that think the ox herders are metaphors for shepherds. Upon taking the animals in they say Christmas has come early, and prayer is recited throughout the entire prison. At the end of the film we also see some of the prisoners get red rings on the top of their heads, and these could be seen as halos, further evoking this idea. Now this scene actually takes place at Blast Beach in Siam, which I've visited a number of times, and Though you instantly get the bleakness from this opening, I promise it doesn't look that sh** in real life. Some celebrities even visit it, like Sigourney Weaver, and of course, world famous YouTube megastar sensation, Kevin Spoilers. Now we have the natural beauty of the sand mixed in with the industrial cranes, and it gives the planet a feeling like Blast Beach is about to get zero stars on TripAdvisor. Now you might not notice this, but the creative team actually used parts of an X-Wing in order to create this miniature crane. Twin sons also appear in this shot, possibly linking back to Luke's home on Tatooine. Now at this point we meet Clemens, who very much becomes a sort of Dallas archetype. Both characters are propped up as seemingly major protagonists, but they're killed at the movie's midpoint to show no one is safe. He shows the complexity of these prisoners as well, and he also represents a rehabilitation that they can all go through. Previously a doctor, we learn he became addicted to morphine when he was back in medical school. One day there was a giant industrial accident which caused the death of several workers and along with this brought a number of casualties. Called in to help, he was so high he prescribed the wrong dosage of painkillers and in turn this caused the death of 11 people. Jailed for 7 years on the planet, he ended up staying there when his sentence ended because he realised that he had nowhere else to go. His medical licence had been reduced to a class 3C which echoes how Ripley's licence was downgraded in Aliens after the hearing. Now Ripley recognises he's a prisoner because he has a barcode on the back of his head which we see the inmates sporting early on in the film. This likely inspired Agent 47 in the Hitman series and to me it being tattooed on shows the corporation now owns these people forever. Though they may leave the prison they'll never actually be able to escape its confines which adds to why Clemens probably decided to remain behind. He also represents how looser structures of authorities are within the prison. When the warden is shown to us, he's surrounded by prisoners, but he's on the lower deck whilst a lot of them stand above him. This is to show that he isn't the one looking down on them, and we get the idea that there's this imbalance within the prison. We learn in the assembly cut that the prisoners could overthrow him at any time, and they even have an honour system in place when it comes to things like the axes and so on. However, if they killed him or 85, then the supplies would stop coming in, and they'd be stuck on this planet without the corporation's help. Although Charles Dance kills it as Clemens, the role was originally offered to Richard E. Grant. Fincher wanted to reunite him alongside with Nail and I co-stars Ralph Brown and Paul McGann, but alas, it wasn't meant to be. Now Ripley is brought in, and I don't know if I'm reaching here, but when Sigourney gets dropped on the table, I don't know if she's pushing out her stomach to try and imply pregnancy, 
but it does seem like she has got a bump. Look, she's got a great figure, mate. I'm not hating yet, but just the way she's framed on the bed, it was at least going through my mind. Don't, don't cancel me. Now, as the prisoners search the wreck, dreams are destroyed and they come across what's left of the crew members. This includes Bishop and also Hicks, who at this point's completely unrecognisable. Michael Bean yet, he was, he was so pissed off that he'd been killed off like this, that he wouldn't even allow them to make a dummy of him, hence why it's so mangled. In the end, Bean reluctantly agreed they could use a photo of him, and the actors joke that he actually got paid more to not be in the movie than he did for working for 10 months on Aliens. Now inside the prison, we meet Charles S. Studden, who's playing Dylan. In the novel, he has a single dreadlock, but they don't go with this in the live action because of the colony's lice problem. In early drafts of the script, Dylan was known as Malcolm, and it's possible that the Malcolm X glasses he wears are a carryover from this. Dylan was actually jailed early on in his life for manslaughter, and when he was doing his time he got into acting and built a career upon his release. He said he channeled this for his character in the film, and I definitely think he brings a lot with him for this really memorable role. Now Clemens tends to Ripley, and the reason she's so knocked out at this point is not only because of the crash, but also because of the cryotube. These were built to awaken their subjects slowly, but being thrown out of one means that half your body's asleep whilst the other part of it's awake. Leads to this sort of hangover feeling, but Ripley also does something subtle upon coming too. She starts to rub her neck, which is probably sore from the facehugger, being down there to implant the embryo. Throughout the movie, this gets worse and worse, and it calls back to when she woke up from the Nightmare on Aliens and grabbed her chest. Now at this point, Clemens tells her the bad news about Hicks and Newt. Obviously, th this annoyed all the fans at the time, as it killed off their favourites and made the events of the last movie completely pointless. Ripley at the start of this movie is almost exactly where she was at the end of the first film, and James Cameron also said that it ruined his happy ending, but you approve killing John Connor, mate, which did the same shit. So f you. Anyway, R R R sorry if you're watching this, James. I didn't mean. I'm just joking there. Now Ripley demands to see the bodies after suspecting Newt might have been infected. The shot at the start had her mouth wide open in the cryo tube, and this was meant to make us think that it hadn't got her because we we could clearly see her face. Again, though, it flies by so quickly that you can't really pick it up. But yeah, that's why it was used the way it was. We also don't get a return of the actress behind you either, as I'm shaking sure guess she had kinda aged out of the role. Carrie Hen at this point was replaced by Danielle Edmonds, who took over Newt, and like Carrie, this is the only film she ever starred in. Now Ripley starts to inspect her, and she says she's searching for cholera. Clemens says that there hasn't been an infection of it in over 200 years, and we know from the timeline that this movie takes place in 2179. The original took place in 2122, 57 years ago, making this film take place in the same year that the prior aliens did. That's why the bishop at the end can look like an android, even though he's supposed to be a human. Look, we'll, we'll get into that mess later on in the video. Anyway, Clemens uses cholera as an excuse to the warden as to why he had to carry out the autopsy, and due to him in 85 being thick, they just don't question it. Now from here we cut to the ox scene, which wasn't fully filmed for the movie, so they had to cobble it together with parts of the stuff we shot without Fincher in order to release it here. We get the alien birth shot alongside the funeral for Newton Hicks, and we're very much meant to have this juxtaposition of death and birth together. The bodies are also wrapped up, and they appear similar to how Kane's body did in that first film. Ripley also gets a nosebleed at this point, which is something that she's had throughout all of the films. Anyway, here we see the smaller alien coming out, which was nicknamed the Bambi Burster by those in the prop shop. Though it looks like early CGI, there was actually very little used in this film, with it only being applied for the flying debris on the planet and the xenomorphs head cracking with the sprinkler. The rest was achieved through the use of a rod puppet, which was then superimposed on top of the film. Now, For some of the close-ups, they also went back to using a man in a suit. They also had plans of using an actual dog, and there were behind the scenes images of a dog with a xenomorph costume on that they were going to have running around. It was going to be ridiculous, and H.R. Giger was also brought on to reconceptualise the creature and design what he imagined it to look like if it had come from a four-legged animal. They also nearly went back to his original designs, and at one point did a model that had human lips. Now Ripley gets her head shaved and then showers, and she wraps her arms around herself as she does it. Why am I bringing this up? Well, I'm not perfect, and it's because Alien Resurrection actually reuses this imagery when we see the Ripley clone bald with her arms wrapped around her just like this shot. Whew, I think I got away with it. Now, on top of the Joan of Arc metaphors, now playing also pointed out that in some way she's meant to resemble a cancer patient. She has something metastasizing inside of her that will kill her, and the shaven head echoes what happens to people going through chemotherapy. 
Now it's not too long before the xenomorph grows, and snake skin like shedding is found in one of the fans. Nice little touch is that you can see lice moving around, showing how much they infect every aspect of the planet. The xenomorph spits acid in the inmate's face, who you might recognise as being Christopher Fairbank. He starred in a number of things such as Batman 89, Fifth Element, and yeah, I love seeing the guy pop up in every movie that he does. Either way, him falling into the fan covers up the fact the xenomorph is out there, but paranoia slowly seeps back into Ripley's head. Over pillow talk with Clemens, she talks about having a terrifying dream during hypersleep, and this is some of the Kane's dream of smothering in the first film. Strange things start to happen with inmates slowly disappearing, and again, not to harp on too much about the different cuts, but Look, you know how much I was dreading going back to this film, however, watching the longer version wrapped me up in its mystery, and I love seeing the prisoners slowly start to suspect that something was off. Clemens ends up getting called in by the warden, and on his desk we can catch a nodding blue bird. Two of these appeared at the start of the first Alien film, and Ridley Scott put them in place to foreshadow the eggs we got down the line. Ripley ends up dragging Bishop out of the trash, and at this point she's jumped, which leads to Dylan rescuing her. Now, I never really picked up on this, but now playing went through how inconsistent his character was and looking at it with his meta knowledge, I can kind of see the seams now. Dylan is someone who goes from thinking Ripley's sin embodied and by just being a woman, he calls her intolerable. In the next scene though, he's saving her life before becoming her closest ally in the wake of Clemens' death. They pointed out that he's actually a victim of the numerous rewrites and script changes that the movie had happened to it with him basically being either friendly or completely hating Ripley depending on what version you read. Now his death was also changed numerous times throughout the production, with him initially giving his life in the assembly hall to stop the xenomorph from killing Morse. He was also going to discover a nest it had built, with several bodies cocooned up against the walls for the impending alien queen. If you go back and rewatch Alien and Aliens, you might notice that the xenomorphs rarely tend to actually kill people, and most of the time, they just tend to drag them off. However, this xenomorph just murders people outright, whereas the cocoon scene was meant to be more consistent with the rest of the franchise. Anyway, Ripley ends up bringing Bishop back online, and these effects, I think, still look incredible. The crazy thing is that the people who made the cast for this didn't even have Lance Henriksen for the mold, and they did most of this separately by building two dummies. The second was only made because the first didn't seem to look enough like Lance, and Fincher actually wanted to have even less of a head. However, they didn't completely scrap it, and this first version was placed primarily in all the white shots. Either way, you compare this to the Ash Head and Alien, and you can see how much the industry improved when it came to special effects like this. Although this movie is really bleak, they do kind of have a dark sense of humour to it, with Bishop jokingly saying that his legs hurt and that he likes Ripley's hair. The Warden also dies during a scene in which he gives a big speech about how the Xenomorph doesn't exist just before he's pulled up into the vents, which leads to his little bouncy ball dropping down hilariously. Watching the guy mop up his entrails and wordly looking up into the vents always cracks me up and moments like this did start to win me round when I was doing this rewatch. Now what Fincher did brilliantly is that he balanced these moments out with some unforgettable horror. Unfortunately though, I think that the death of Clemens coming out of nowhere and the way it does initially made a lot of people start to turn on this movie. We went from having someone we'd seen Ripley buddy up to for the entire film, who, who had been given the majority of the character development and pretty much the entire spotlight outside of her. After his death, the warden gets killed quickly after and thus we're left with characters who've had little to no screen time which kind of makes you stop caring about the group as a whole. Now I also think that the movie suffers from not having the distinct personalities in the crew that the first two films had. For example, every single side character in the team in both Alien and Aliens was standouts that I think you could pick out of a lineup. Here though, you've got about 20 generic clean shaven skinheads that all dress the same and are roughly the same age. You don't really gravitate towards them like you did those in the other films and the ones you get to know like Clemens are killed at the midpoint. So watching him being taken out just feels like a massive gut punch. However, it is impactful and it's also followed up by one of the most iconic shots in cinema history. The xenomorph up next to Ripley is something that will burn itself into your brain and I can imagine it's one of the first things that come up if you google the movie. You also probably get the film's iconic poster too and we can see from the head of the small chest burster here that this is a queen which is a nice little hint to what's inside of Ripley. Ripley lasts way longer than the other people in the franchise who just dated xenomorphs instead of them, but this is primarily down to her having a queen which takes far longer to grow. 
Anyway, they launch their first attack, but the preparation for this is cut short when the Xenomorph attacks midway. Setting off a gigantic explosion, we get a great bit of foreshadowing when the sprinklers put out the blaze. On the floor we see a cracked bucket, which then shifts on its own as the thermal reactions caused. This is how the aliens kill later on, with the heat from the lava being contrasted by the thermal shock of the sprinklers. This reaction happens due to a rapid change in temperature, which shifts molecules about quickly and causes materials to crack. Heat makes something expand, whereas cold temperatures contract it, and thus these two things happening at once causes structural failure. A golly at one point tells Ripley that she's gonna die too, correctly predicting her fate come the end of the movie. Spoiler alert. <sighs> Now, I think the moment of the inmates getting a victory here works way better than the loss than they get in the theatrical cut. It's harrowing seeing that one guy realise that he's gonna have to leave the xenomorph in the chamber in order to trap it, and hearing his screams from behind the door adds so much more to the sacrifice he's just given. I think they needed a win here, whereas in the theatrical cut, it just feels like all the death was for nothing, and they don't get the breather that allows them to learn what the company's up to. In the original version, it doesn't make much sense for them to be standing around doing nothing, whereas here Ripley learns the company's dead set on getting her and the Xenomorph. They deny permission to destroy it, and whilst this is going on, Golic frees it once more. To make matters worse, Ripley discovers the embryo inside of her, and after realising the Xenomorph won't kill it, she goes on the hunt. Travelling into the basement, she does this because she discovered the hive was located in the lower levels during the previous movie. The company also announces that they'll be there in two hours, and we get a shot of their ship in space echoing the Soloko with its gun shape and structure. Now in the basement, we see the alien further using the environment to its advantage. In our previous breakdowns, we've talked about how the ship designs were purposely done to mirror the Xenomorph, and this allowed it to camouflage itself into the environment. That's the case here, with the creature hiding amongst the pipes, and Ripley somewhat hallucinates seeing it as they have the creature crouched down. This is revealed to just be a pipe, but rewind that mate, cause you can't fool me, that, that, that is the suit. Now we instead see it located in the vents above her, blending in perfectly with the environment. It won't kill Ripley, and thus she realises that she needs to be used as a weapon. We get a big rousing speech from Dylan, and you might notice that there's large red Japanese letters painted on the wall. These appear throughout the movie, and they represent not only Whale and Yutani, but they also translate to mean iron, due to this being a refinery. Now this location provides the perfect place for a final chase scene, with the humans attempting to leave the xenomorph in the mould. I love the use of the xenomorph's point of view as it races through the corridors, leading to a really tense action scene as it whittles down the survivors. Now as this is going on, we get the arrival of Lance Henriksen. Now this guy being an android or not is something that's been debated back and forth amongst the alien community for decades. To make matters more confusing, Lance Henriksen said conflicting things depending on what interview you read. Sometimes he is, and sometimes he isn't, and the credits themselves also list him as playing the character Bishop too. Now this has led a lot of people to believing that he's an android, but there are some clues that have actually cleared up the confusion. Now though the credits have been said to have been a mistake by the creative team, the two is true, but not in the way we think. In Aliens vs Predator, we see Lance playing a character called Charles Bishop, who we learn founded the Whalen Corporation. In Aliens Colonial Marines, it's actually said that his name's Michael Whalen, so at some point, it probably changed to Bishop. Therefore, Michael Bishop could have been an ancestor, and then the character we see here is Michael Bishop II, rather than being the second version of Bishop. Now when the character is clocked at the end, we see his ear hanging off, and there's red blood dripping from it. Though the ear is at an angle that I've never seen a human have before, it is important to bear in mind that there's red blood rather than the white fluid that we see dripping out of damaged androids. There's also the script which says Ripley looks over at him, and we get the description, no wires, no milk, real blood. Now in addition to this, Bishop here actually shows genuine emotion to Ripley, and upon being clocked over the head, he doesn't suffer from speech changes. In every other alien movie, whenever an android's damaged like this, their voice becomes more digitised, which isn't the case here. Therefore, I think that this is a real man, and the reason his ear goes like this is because he has some cybernetic parts located within his head. Being higher up in the company could mean that he has access to tech like this, and can enhance himself to a certain level. Anyway, back with Dylan and Ripley, we see as the former remains behind so he can keep the xenomorph in the mould. The boiling hot lead seemingly kills it, but the xenomorph shows just how indestructible it is by crawling its way out. 
In the end, Ripley manages to kill it, but there's just one specimen left. Now, I can't remember this line in the theatrical cut, but Bishop offers her this. You still can have a life. Children. Ripley's entire arc in the second movie was based around motherhood with her learning of her daughter's death before she became a surrogate one to Newt. Though Bishop says that he wants to take the creature out of her to kill it, this isn't the case as when she goes to end her life, he reveals what he actually wants to do. He also calls the creature a magnificent specimen, which is what Bishop did in the previous movie. Now this would very much be a deal with the devil in which she would get a family and to be a mother again, but it would cost countless lives and ultimately lead to more death. Thus her turning it down shows she's a true hero, and we also see this reflected in the character Aaron. Though he was talking about returning home to his wife and child, we watch as he dies after attacking Bishop. He's fired at by the guards who are armed with M41A pulse rifles, which are the weapons that the marines used in the prior entry. Now, in the end, this leads to Morse being the sole survivor, and though Ripley assumed the company would kill everyone, he is left alive. We also know his fate from this point onwards, and Morse was transported to another class C prison, which is where he was plagued with nightmares. Eventually, he lost his faith in religion, and though he was threatened by the company to not discuss anything that happened on the planet, he did go against this. He published a book called Space Beast in 2183, which didn't sell many copies, and it was quickly banned. However, we do know from the Alien Resurrection script that Cole read a copy of it, which allowed it to learn about Ripley and also the Xenomorph. Anyway, that closes out the movie, and we hear Ripley's final message from the first film before we end transmission. Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo, signing off. This is Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo, signing off. And that's Alien 3. Looking back, I'm glad you guys twisted my arm into doing this as I actually enjoy the retread in the end. Though it's definitely the worst out of the first three, I think there's a lot to like here if you dig deep enough and seek out the superior longer version. This movie would actually go on to majorly shape Finch's career, and he moved away from doing studio-driven films to work on his own stuff which gave him more creative control. It was a smart move too, as we've had a number of classics from him over the years. David Toy also ended up reworking his original vision, and this became, you guessed it, pitch black. Now we also have this amazing audiobook of the original plans for the movie out there too, and looking back, you know, it might have worked out for the best. All in all, I also think there's a lot to like from this movie, and I hope you enjoyed our retread through it. Just as long as you guys don't make me watch Alien Resurrection, we should be. Oh, you, you're gonna make me do it, aren't you? You're gonna make me. F say now, I wanna do Robocop next, and then the first two Terminators, and then I'll probably return to Resurrection to resurrect this series. Thank you for all your support on it, and it's been great watching you guys love these other breakdowns as much as I love doing them. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our video on Aliens, which will be linked on screen right now. But out of the way, a huge thank you for clicking this. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.